So this is a new series where I talk about highlights and lessons from all the books that have changed my life. If you haven't seen my announcement video yet, go and check that out because I announced some changes I'm going to be making in my channel. Now, I won't just feature books for the sake of having content for this series. I'm actually going to choose books that have made a significant impact in the way I think, in the way I live. And I figured it's probably best if I start with perhaps my favorite book and that's Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. When I'm at my worst, like when I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling afraid, when I'm feeling lost, stuck, or when I'm feeling doubtful about myself. I'm sure you guys have those moments when the self-talk in your head is just a little bit more hurtful than usual. This is the book that saves me. This book is also perfect if you're about to start a new business or maybe you don't know what to start or maybe you're about to pursue a different career path this book is for you. And so here are seven lessons I learned from this book. Lesson number one, fear is boring, so stop defending it. I know that the title of this book kinda implies that it's only about art, but honestly guys, it applies to everything. Because whether you're starting a business or you're starting a new career path, or maybe it you're just simply asking out a person you like on a date, fear will always find a way to creep in. Elizabeth Gilbert pointed out the many things we tell ourselves every time we're about to pursue something interesting. We tell ourselves na you can't do this, you're not talented enough, there's no market for this, somebody else has already done it, someone might steal your ideas, you're too old to start, you're too young to start, or that people will make fun of you. All of this applied to me when I was starting this channel. Like I would see similar channels and I would see such good work that they would put out and it would just make me think, how am I ever gonna top that? Or when I was sharing to people that I had this plan where I wanted to talk about brand histories and they would tell me stuff like, oh, there are already lots of other channels like that. But I love how Elizabeth Gilbert responds to this. She said that, yeah, it's already been done, but it hasn't been done by you. She insists that we should stop defending our fears. Have you guys found yourselves in these situations where you actually try to defend your fears? I have personally met people who are so passionately defending their weaknesses and how they always seem to have the perfect response on why they're not meant to achieve a certain thing. Argue for your limitations and you get to keep them. That quote sums it up. Elizabeth Gilbert explains how fear is so boring that fear is a song with only one note. There's no variety to it. Every time you consider doing something interesting, fear always responds with the same one word. Stop. And it's not really the type of life you would want to live, would it? This leads me to one of my favorite parts of the book. And I've read this a couple of times, na, but every time I do, it always gives me chills because of how beautifully Elizabeth Gilbert captures it. She calls it her welcoming speech to fear since every time you pursue an interesting project, fear and creativity are inseparable. And so she sees this journey as a road trip and I just have to read it to you guys because it's already perfectly written. Dearest Fear, Creativity and I are about to go on a road trip together. I understand you'll be joining us because you always do. I acknowledge that you believe you have an important job to do in my life and that you take your job very seriously. Apparently, your job is to induce complete panic whenever I'm about to do anything interesting. And may I say, you are superb at your job. So by all means, keep doing your job if you feel you must. But I will also be doing my job on this road trip, which is to work hard and stay focused. And creativity will be doing its job, which is to remain stimulating and inspiring. There's plenty of room in this vehicle for all of us, so make yourself at home. But understand this. Creativity and I are the only ones who will be making any decisions along the way. I recognize and respect that you are a part of this family, and so I will never exclude you from our activities. But still, your suggestions will never be followed. You're allowed to have a seat and you're allowed to have a voice, but you are not allowed to have a vote. You're not allowed to touch the roadmaps, you're not allowed to suggest detours, you're not allowed to fiddle with the temperature. Dude, you're not even allowed to touch the radio. But above all else, my dear old familiar friend, you are absolutely forbidden to drive. Then we head off together, me and creativity and fear, side by side by side forever, advancing once more into the terrifying but marvelous terrain of unknown outcome. That part always gets me. The third lesson is all about Mark Manson's concept of the sh sandwich. When we were little, we were told to follow our passion and that if we ever find a job that we are truly passionate about, the work won't feel like work, it will feel like play. This concept forgets that in any endeavor we pursue, what comes along with it is its own sets of consequences and drawbacks. This is where the idea of the sandwich comes in. Mark Manson wrote that we shouldn't worry too much about asking what are you passionate about? What are you passionate enough about that you can endure the most disagreeable aspects of the work? 
like if you want to have kids you're gonna have to accept that you're gonna have less time for yourself and maybe your career will take a hit. If you dream of becoming a doctor, then you have to be okay with being on call all the time and seeing people at their worst physical state. It's easy to want to become a YouTuber, especially when you see all the financial success that they're getting when you see their fancy houses. But then you're also gonna have to accept that you're gonna get hate comments all the time whether you create excellent work or not. And maybe your private life will no longer be as private as you'd hope. I used to want to become a lawyer because lawyers give off this unbreakable confidence but then i discovered that to be a great lawyer you're gonna be dealing with horrific stories of people doing horrible things to each other like i don't want to know the details of how that 10 year old girl got assaulted by her dad but then some people are okay with that and those people should definitely become lawyers each path has its own sets of not so nice aspects and elizabeth gilbert sums it up perfectly because if you love and want something enough whatever it is you don't really mind the sandwich that comes with it. The fourth lesson is all about originality versus authenticity. Now, when you're about to start a business or a YouTube channel, a podcast, or maybe you're writing a book, one of the most common objections in our head is, I have an idea, but I'm afraid it's already been done. And we find ourselves trying to figure out creating something original, something that's never been done before. Well, Originality is overrated. Elizabeth Gilbert points out that Shakespeare has pretty much covered every type of storyline there is, yet five centuries later, writers have been exploring the same storylines all over again. It's unnecessary to carry the burden and pressure of trying to be original. Chances are it's already been done before, and trying to be original can sometimes feel forced and sad. But authenticity on the other hand has what she describes as quiet resonance. You can tell when a person is trying to want to like to do something and whether a person genuinely loves doing something. She explains that the books that she writes, even this one, she didn't write it for us readers. She wrote it because she wanted to. She wrote it because she enjoyed it. And oftentimes, our authenticity gives off a wonderful side effect. And quoting from the book, Merely by pursuing what you love, you may inadvertently end up helping us plenty. Do whatever brings you to life then. Follow your fascinations, your obsessions, and your compulsions. Create whatever causes a revolution in your heart. The rest will take care of itself. The fifth lesson is on how to find that thing that feels most authentic to you. So you know how the whole follow your passion thing has been generously been thrown around, especially from motivational guru types? So you know how when you're feeling lost, like you don't know what your next move in life is, um, a friend will probably go to you and tell you, just, just do something you enjoy, just go follow your passion. But the thing is, this isn't helpful at all. In fact, Elizabeth Gilbert considers this cruel because odds are, People are already trying to find their passion, they just don't know what their passion is. It's like telling someone who's going through depression, just be happy. Instead of following your passion, which is completely abstract, the way to find your passion is through curiosity. Curiosity doesn't ask much of you, it simply asks, regardless of how small or mundane it is. Is there something that you're currently interested in? Curiosity doesn't require you to make life-changing decisions, like you don't have to quit your job. Curiosity is all about simply pausing and identifying the tiniest speck of interest in something and letting it lead you down the rabbit hole. Actually, that's when I realized that everything I was doing here in my channel was just me following my curiosity. I was doing my groceries, saw a bottle of Evian water, and I was wondering why it was so expensive. And so I googled Evian and discovered that it's from a specific watershed, and I didn't know what watersheds were, and I googled that one too. And I googled another thing, and another, and another, and this eventually ended up being my script for Evian water. Considering that curiosity led me here, to find my passion, my this channel, what I'm doing now, since it's something that I wouldn't mind doing for a very long time, Elizabeth Gilbert was right. The best part is that curiosity never runs out. It's just about listening to that shy voice in your head asking you, huh, what is that? Who made that? I wonder why it is like that. So curiosity, it opens doors and it asks you where those doors lead. And the best part is that it's completely free and completely endless because there's always another question to ask. Elizabeth Gilbert said that if you do follow your curiosity and it amounts to nothing in the end, you will have the satisfaction of knowing that you have passed your entire existence in devotion to the noble human virtue of inquisitiveness. And that should be more than enough for anyone to say that they have lived a rich and splendid life. 
Lesson number six, don't apologize. The sixth lesson is to not apologize about your work. There will come a point when it's time to put your work out there. And believe me, it's always frightening. Elizabeth Gilbert shares that never in her life has she created anything that didn't make her feel like she was walking into a fancy ball wearing a homemade lobster costume. Remember that your agreement with the universe wasn't that you would do great work. You only agree that you would do the work. So once you put yourself and your work out there, never apologize for it. Never be ashamed of it. You did your best with what you knew and you worked with what you had and in the time that you were given. I mean, what's the worst could happen? People might hate it. People might hate how you look. People might hate your voice. Sure. But then they might also not. They might actually love your work. They might actually love you. And now to the last lesson, perfectionists suck. She describes perfectionists as fear in high heels. It's just fear pretending to be elegant when actually it's terrified. When you've decided to pursue something, remember that you don't have to have it all figured out in the beginning. You can learn along the way. I mean, sure, you may feel that you're not good enough or you may compare yourself to others doing the same thing, but remember that even the best in their field still feel the same way. So apparently, Marcus Aurelius had a diary, and in that diary, he wrote something about he was trying to reassure himself that it's okay not to be as good as Plato. And Elizabeth Gilbert finds this whole idea very reassuring. If one of the world's greatest philosophers has ever doubted himself, then then it means that it's pretty normal. She also reminds us that done is better than perfect. Don't expect greatness to come knocking at your door the first time you put your work out there. Don't even expect it to happen within the first year. I mean, it could happen, but you should care less about that and care more about improving yourself, improving your craft, and you can do this by simply putting in the hours and doing the work. And I quote, If greatness should ever stumble upon you, let it catch you hard at work. There is so much to learn from this book. I keep this book with me all the time. This book is just for my YouTube background. I have another one on Kindle. I have the audiobook. My mom and sister have their own copies as well. If you're feeling a bit lost right now or you need a bit of courage because you're about to start something new, I highly recommend this book. If you do decide to buy this book, I would absolutely appreciate it if you click the link below. I buy my physical books on fullybook.com and I buy my ebook and audible versions from Amazon. So if you're getting the ones from Amazon, I would love it if you could use my affiliate link so that I could earn from it a bit. I would love to know what your favorite part of the book was, so let me know in the comments. And that's about it. I'll see you in the next video.